Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. This is your host, Rachel Jamison. Today we are interviewing, or I am interviewing, Krista Green from Zone 3 Vegetable Gardening. Krista, could you introduce yourself and tell the audience where your what your site is and where it can be located? You have a few different social media sites. Mm-hmm. And then just introduce yourself. Tell us about where you live and kind of how you got here. Sure. Yeah. I It's always an honor to be a guest on a podcast. So thanks for letting me come chat with you today, Rachel. Um, I'm Krista Green, as you mentioned, and my website that I run is Zone 3 Vegetable Gardening. And as the name describes, a lot of what I do is growing vegetables in my cold climate. So I am located, I'm up in Canada, um, in Alberta, just south of Calgary, in a small town um, of about just under 2,000 people called Black Diamond. And we have four acres here and three kids. My kids are between the ages of eight and 12 now. And um, yeah, I have quite a big vegetable garden. We keep adding to it and adding to it. We have some chickens here on the property. Um, A couple, two great Pyrenees, which are amazing with our chickens. Yeah, I adore them. And um, yeah, I guess you asked me to talk a little bit more about what I do. So I like to share and teach about gardening. I, When we first moved to this property, I actually really struggled a lot with growing a garden. Some of my background behind this, I did grow up gardening. My mom loved to garden. We always had a family garden, although I was in a warmer climate in the Okanagan area of B.C., And so we moved to Alberta when I was 14, I think. And gardening here definitely is a lot different than gardening in BC. Um, But we still had a big garden here. And then I worked at a greenhouse for a long time. So, yeah. So when we lived in town, I used a community garden. That was successful. I loved it. And then once we moved to this acreage seven years ago, this four acres, um, yeah, I, I really, really struggled my first year. I would call it a flop. My carrots were tiny. My beets were tiny. My lettuce didn't grow. And, uh, I, all of a sudden was left searching for answers of what I could do to fix those things. And in my searching, I, I found I wanted more mentors that were in this climate. So mm-hmm. then as I've been learning and because I do, I had, I, a garden knowledge that I was able to bring with me here to help troubleshoot some of my my issues, which mostly are soil issues. My soil and my water are both awful. But anyways, um, so as I learned, I just grew in a desire to help other people so that they didn't have to have such a hard time learning all these things I was learning. Yeah. So then, yeah, now I, I share a lot on Instagram. I'm really active on Instagram under Zone 3 Vegetable Gardening. I do offer... I have one online self-paced gardening course where I've tried to package everything into a nice package to help people get started. And then I do some coaching. I do some online courses and um, I'm taking courses through University of Saskatchewan. I'm on my second course right now and uh, hopefully I'll do a third a spring okay. semester one. Mm-hmm. And those are all for gardening and yeah, those are for gardening because I felt like I had the hands-on practical knowledge, but I'm wanting to learn. Um, more of the book knowledge base to add to that so nice. that I can, because I like teaching so much so that then it just, yeah, then I can help problem solve other people's problems better. That's really, so that's a little bit. Yeah. About me and where I come yeah. from. Well, you said that um, you, you kind of grew up doing a little bit of this. Um, did you say how much land you have? You have four acres. You did say that. We have, yeah. Four. Yeah. So what is it that you what is it that you grow and what methods do the do you use? Do you grow in your typical rows that we see on TV? Or are you growing in raised beds? What what are some of your favorite methods that you're using? You said you have poor soil and poor water mm-hmm. to help grow. For sure. So we have Deer is one of my problems I deal with here. Lots and lots of deer around. So I have, um, I call it my garden compound. We have a big, like nine foot deer fence around my main vegetable garden. I do use raised beds. Part of the reason for that being my poor soil 
um, I also have poplar trees around and poplar roots are awful. Uh, they even my raised beds, they come up in them and they steal the nutrients. But anyways, instead of instead of trying to deal with the poplar roots. Uh, oh, and the other thing, we are actually on a reclaimed gravel pit land. So it's something oh, wow. I didn't think about before I moved here, but they strip all that great topsoil. And yeah, it's rocks under the ground pretty much and then replace okay. it with a couple inches of not great topsoil. Um, so yeah, those are those are some of the challenges that I have been able to overcome using raised beds by learning a lot of things, working working on my soil. So the raised beds, I personally use treated wood. This is very controversial. Yeah, In Canada, our wood is treated with copper and oh, only okay. copper. Okay. So arsenic has not been allowed to be used in treated wood here for, yeah, that's I want to say difference. about 17 years. Okay. Yeah. So people are, I just want to throw this out here because a lot of people are uneducated. They have no idea. And so now I'm seeing all these things about people adding copper into their gardens. Have you seen that? Because it's supposed to deter pests and it's supposed to be good for your soil and your plants. I've seen and people I'm thinking, adding copper, but I've also seen people using copper wires for the electroculture. So I've seen a lot yeah. more about copper lately. It seems to yeah. be like a hot topic. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I can't say I know a ton about it, but okay. I, I just find it ironic that people are like, you cannot use treated wood in your race beds. And then when you actually do the research, it's like, OK, here in Canada, they use copper. So you won't use treated wood, but you will add copper to your soil right <laughs> that, those two don't match up anyways so i just thought i would throw out that little bit of that interesting so i didn't yeah. know that um i mean it makes sense you're a different country so they use they do things differently i think that we i haven't done the research lately because i don't i don't have raised beds right now but i think that they have changed using arsenic i would hope so that they've changed yeah. that as well in the state but i'm not positive so. so nobody quote yeah me neither am i <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So, so are you yeah, making I do. your own compost then to put into these I do. beds? Okay. Yeah. And chickens and gardening, I feel like they go so well hand yeah. in hand. Yes. They are great compost creators. Hey. Eh? Yes. The wood shavings and the manure. And then, you know, all the garden scraps you can throw into the chickens and then just yeah, you end up with lots of compost that you can add into your garden. I do sometimes okay. outsource compost. I have a friend who is right. sheep. I've gotten some from her and I have a friend who has cattle, horses, goats that I've gotten some from because I have such a large garden and I only have like 20 to 30 chickens. Perfect. Perfect. Most times. Mm -hmm. How big is your garden? Do you know? Um, I have, I think I have 11, 10 by four foot raised beds. I haven't done the math on the square footage. And then I have another garden garden bed that kind of runs along the outside of the garden so okay. yeah I nice I don't know hopefully that gives people a ballpark idea right I do feel like where it's at right now I am able to grow a lot of the food needed for our family of four we definitely don't always eat garden produce um there's nights that it's like chicken nuggets and fries. I know that's not the healthiest. And We're all I would love, I would love <laughs> if we always ate garden produce. But I'm able to grow all my garlic, all my onions. We still have garden carrots in the fridge that the kids take to school. They're sick of, but right. that's okay. Yeah. Um, potatoes to last through the oh, year. So potatoes. I still have some little pumpkins and some butternut squash uh, stored that I'm using up. So yeah, I so that's I feel... what, are you growing other things? Like I know those are like your longer storage crops. Um, you have a fairly big garden. So are you growing pretty much most of your food, at least in the summer, probably a lot of your vegetables in the summer and then yes, in the bring summer. it over to the winter? <laughs> Yeah. And through the winter, um, in the winter, I also have the hydroponic growing yes, system right. indoors. Yes. My goal has always been kind of to grow all. Ideally, I would love to grow right. all the food our family needed to carry through a year. That is, I don't know that I will ever reach that, but we can always strive for that, right? Right. Um, when, when I say all the food we need, I included in that would be the food the chickens need. Because yeah, I was going to ask you about that. If you part grow of anything for them. I don't grow okay. 
a lot for them. I grow sunflowers. Sunflowers are good for the soil. They add nitrogen back into the soil. And then they're, they're one thing that you can clip off the tops and throw them into the chickens if the birds don't mm-hmm. strip them first. So that's something I grow for the bees. I grow for the chickens. I grow for the soil. And I grow because they're pretty. Right. Um, and then, yeah, definitely any garden scraps that the chickens can have, we send their way. Very cool. I, that's one of my goals, too, is to grow some feed for the for the chickens and, and, and other animals that we hope to acquire at some point. But um, yeah. so you said that you're doing some some indoor gardening mm-hmm. with the hydroponics. Have you found that uh, a, a learning curve? And do you have a large system? What are you growing in that? And are you just growing in the winter in that? Yeah, so I do only use it in the winter because I prefer to be outside and in. And in the summer, I have an abundance of vegetables. Um, the hydroponic growing system, it is a large one. It's a garden tower. It's from Juice Plus. Okay. I do have a blog post I wrote recently on it that I tried to answer because I get a lot of questions on it. So I tried to answer all the questions I commonly get asked. So if you head over to my website, Zone 3 Vegetable Gardening, and find okay. that blog post, I have more information. Um, so I try and seed the hydroponics in mid-August would be ideal because then by the end of September, when my lettuces have froze, I would be harvesting from the hydroponic tower. You can grow things like strawberries, cucumbers, um, pretty much what you can't grow with hydroponics is anything that is a, considered a root vegetable, okay. right? Which makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mostly use it for greens, lots of, and herbs. So lots of fresh lettuce, the pak choy, if you're a pak choy or bok choy yeah, person it, that does, it. yeah, that does really, really well in the hydroponics. Okay. And I love, you know, if I can have fresh cilantro and parsley and thyme and rosemary and all those fresh herbs all winter long. Dill, dill does amazing. I cannot keep up with my dill from the hydroponic nice. garden. Mm-hmm. So are you using the little, um, the cocoa or not the cocoa core? What are rock they? wall. The rock, rock wall. That's I, what yeah. it's called. So you're using yeah. the little rock wall in that. And is your system like just on like a timer? It is. Yeah. Okay, it, nice. So it all came as one big package. That's pretty cool. When, yeah, when you if you look at buying one, you can do pay monthly over twelve months, which I really like that option with, for no extra cost. Like there's no, you oh, know, that's really nice. Yeah, nothing in there, and it's also nice because if you kind of think of it as like part of your grocery bill. So yes, your grocery bill's higher for twelve months, but then after that, it's paid off, and it's going to lower your grocery bill from then on, right? So how long have you had it? I have had mine for three. I ran okay. it for three winters. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, I've had no issues at all. I'm still okay. using the original. Like they give you big jugs of the hydroponic solution. Oh, okay. And, yeah. Yeah. I'm getting low on those jugs, but I, and I did order some extra rock wool when I first ordered it, but I've never had to reorder anything. So, and I just use my normal wow, outdoor seeds. That's really, that's really something. So you paid for that first year and now it's basically been free other than your seeds. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. There is uh, the estimate for how much it costs to run with the lights and the pump. Cause there's a water pump that circulates okay. water every 45 minutes. So I think I personally haven't broke down the energy cost, but people say, and I know energy has gone up. I don't know about you, but well, yeah, it's and it varies here. depending on where you're at too. So much. yeah, but yeah. like I don't know, anywhere from five to ten dollars possibly. Um, I like to think because the lights are so bright. Mine is in the basement, and so if okay. I did not have my hydroponic tower, we would have a light on. But during the day, I'll turn the light off because the tower provides enough light in the basement. You don't. It kind of works okay. as a light down there. So Perfect. I feel like, um, and they're LED lights, so they don't use a lot of energy. So I feel like right. It, it like offsets because then I'm using anyways. So it works out. It And yeah, it's really hands off. Um, when I okay. first put everything in there, um, it, it uh, I don't even have to wa- add water often for about four weeks because the plants are so small, they're not using a lot of it. Okay. And then as they mature, I start to have to add it every seven to 10 days, possibly. 
Um, but besides adding water once in a while, unlike an outdoor garden that, you know, you have to weed and you have to care for, it's super hands off. There's not much you have to do. That's pretty cool. Now, something I've never asked anybody that grows hydroponically, do you taste a difference between the lettuce that you've grown hydroponically and the lettuce that you've grown in the summer in the soil? I do personally taste a little bit of a difference. Um, and then one thing that I was surprised by is the lettuce is a lot nicer if you put it in an ice bath first. So yeah. for those of us in cool climates, we don't really struggle with like warm lettuce. I didn't, I mean, I do know if I want to have lettuce for dinner, I pick it early in the morning so that it is crisp. Uh, I don't pick it in the heat of the afternoon, but, um, the hydroponics, cause the house is a little bit warmer. It, um, yeah, it's a better texture if you chill it in the ice bath before okay. you eat that it. But you don't need to you don't need to actually wash it. You just chill it and dry it. Okay. Because there's never any bugs in here, which is super nice. That is that is really nice because I do have that issue with bugs eating some of my stuff. Yeah, so and kale, if you like smoothies, I'll just throw it there. It grows awesome kale too, or kale oh, I salads. Bet. I bet. Yeah. Kale is just kind of it grows so easily anyway. So I bet you in one of those, it just goes crazy. Yes. Yeah. It's hard to keep up. So you said that um, you wanted to talk about some tips for growing in a short season because you guys, you guys have a short season. Explain how short your season is and, and maybe your temperatures and then maybe give a few tips on growing in a short season. Sure. So I think we are somewhat close to you on frost dates. Um, my last frost, I like to think of it um, around uh, May 26. Although then I'll, I have to watch out in June because it'll just dip down to zero in like mid-June area. So, but our snow is usually done by May 26. So that's when you can transplant things outside. And then fall frost, um, again, fairly similar to you is the middle of September. So okay. you were, yeah, you are in a zone five, six, um, you had said, and I am a zone three. And the reason for that, if, if people haven't looked into zones or don't understand zones, the reason for the difference, even though our, our growing seasons are similar lengths is because I get a lot colder yeah. in the winter. So perennials can't, yeah. um, I can't grow the same perennials as you. And so, yeah, it sounds like we both have a little bit of a short season. So some of my tips for that, if you are a short season grower, um, definitely look for the days to maturity on your seed packages. I'm sure that's something, is that something you check out, especially when you're yes, looking at I do squash? Too. Yeah. yeah. Or I have corn. To, it means I either have to start it inside or, mm -hmm. yeah, or I have to find something that will actually grow within the time period outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So make sure you're looking at the days to maturity when you go to buy seeds and you're buying ones with the shortest, the fewest days to yes. maturity. That's kind of, that's an easy, easy thing to do as long as you know to do it. And then, yeah, like you mentioned, starting things indoors. So some of the things that um, I do start indoors, I start my corn indoors. Our soil is just not warm enough for it to germinate well outside. There might be the odd year that it would be okay. But um, I, so since I've been on the sacred the first four years, I didn't get corn, even though I planted it, I would never get it. I kept trying and trying and trying. And then three years ago, I decided to try starting corn indoors. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, the last three years, I get awesome harvest of corn. It transplants great. I feel like okay. there's this lie out there that says you can't transplant corn. Yeah, I have Not transplanted true. it too. And I've had people think I was crazy. And I'm like, yeah. I, it seemed fine. So how are you doing yours? Are you doing yours in pots or? I am. And corn, sh corn should be in the deepest, narrowest pot you can find. Um, I haven't ordered them, but I know, I think it was that TNT sells some pots that you, like you can open up, they unclip essentially, and you can pull out your corn and they're a reusable one that's supposed to have like a 20 year guarantee. I think it was TNT seeds in Canada. Anyways. Yeah. Long narrow because corn is tall and it doesn't yes. have a big circumference. So it, the longest narrowest pot you can find to grow your corn indoors and with everything you have to harden it off right to the wind, yes. to yes. the sunshine, to the night temperatures. And um, 
if I can, I cover it with plastic for the first couple of weeks, even once it's in the ground, just to keep it warmer because it is a heat loving plant. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, I've so yeah, with the controversy about starting corn indoors, the first year I did it and I posted. So there was all the naysayers that are like, you cannot do this. But then I couldn't believe how many people private messaged me and said, my family's been doing this for 25 years or you know, I grow yeah. a market garden and I've been doing this for 15 years. And I'm like, what? why did nobody tell me sooner? I yeah, thought. it makes it so you can grow a, a couple more varieties than because it's really hard to find a short season corn. It is. And like you were saying, it won't sprout unless it has the warm soil, which is mm-hmm. can be pretty hard some years to accomplish mm-hmm. without that. So that's cool. So are mm-hmm. you growing sweet corn then? I, I am. Yeah. Okay. Like eating corn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then so other things that um, can be hard, like I mentioned, the pumpkins and the squash, those took me a few years to figure out. And I start mine around the end of April inside. Don't okay. start them too soon. Some people think, oh, because this takes a long time, I'm going to start it even earlier. But um, squash and cucumbers are really prone to transplant shock, as I'm sure you know. Yeah. And so if you start it too soon... When you try and plant it outside, it'll just go into transplant shock and die. So kind of trying to figure out that good time to start it. So yeah, for me, the end of April, being super gentle with the roots when you do transplant, hardening them off, as mentioned, you can never, anything you start inside, you have to harden it off. And then my tip for that, again, like I have struggled with squash, is clotches. I don't know if you guys, I assume you have Dollarama in the States. The dollar store, Dollarama. Anyways, oh, we maybe do have a dollar, dollar store, but I haven't s- not called Dollarama. We just ours is called. Okay. We have, yeah, I've never seen cloches there, but I would love to see cloches there. Yeah, our doll, our Dollarama in Canada here, they have these plastic okay. cloches, and they still Very like cool. to get the big size ones. They're four dollars or five dollars for one. So, um, you know, that's not super cheap. But when I do transplant things like pumpkin. I put that cloche over top and I leave it on for a good two or three weeks. So it gets hot mm-hmm. in there during the day. Somebody gave me this tip. They're like, don't take it off. Just leave it on. Like a like little mini cook. Greens. Yeah. I thought I would cook them though when the sun was shining. But no, it, um, yeah. So mm-hmm. I finally feel like, okay, this this helps a little bit. I think we um, need a Dollarama here. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think if I have... Those are some of my my top tips to tomatoes? get me started. I do grow tomatoes. Okay. Are those hard for you there? Because they definitely look like a little bit of warmth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, so definitely those short days to maturity tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Starting indoors, starting uh, mid-March. So a lot earlier. Yeah. And um, then just finding the hottest place you can to put them outside. So sometimes that might be in a pot on a back deck. They need a big pot, as yeah. I know, again, I, I know you you know this, but um, consider using a black pot because that keeps the roots warmer and they Makes like sense. warm roots. Or um, I do have a part of my garden that is just a lot warmer than the rest. So if you have a garden area or a backyard, paying attention to where the snow melts first yeah. is key little, in like thinking, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So I have like two, three beds in my garden that the snow always melts on first and the soil thaws out before the other beds. And it took me a few years to to really clue into this, like plant my heat loving crops in these beds. These are my warmer beds. Like, why am I, you know, we we try crop rotation, but sometimes you have to do it within your micro climate. So whatever you have to work with. Yeah. yeah, on small small pieces of property, sometimes you just have to go with whatever you have to work with. Yeah, are you um, are you growing any fruit at all? And I am trying well there. Okay, so because of my poor soil, okay. um, I have struggled to get any trees established, and okay. so I have raspberries, and raspberries should grow like a weed for anybody. It's sometimes embarrassing. Well, I shouldn't say sometimes. It's embarrassing to admit I struggle to grow raspberries. The deer will eat them. If they're tender, the deer will sneak into my garden because I thought I planted them outside of the compound thinking they would be okay. Um, 
So this when this last winter was the first time I had raspberries inside my garden compound per se. Uh-huh. And I'm really hoping I actually get a decent raspberry crop. I get a few raspberries every year, but I've had dieback. So I I learned that raspberries don't like the wind. So yes, they can grow like a weed if they're a little bit protected from the wind. But the north wind, if you have that full on um, to raspberries, it sometimes will cause that winter kill and the winter dieback in our zone three climate here. Are you guys um, but, kind of flat there? So you get a lot of a lot of wind? We're fairly flat. We are close to the mountains and there's winds that kind of come over the mountains or around the foothills area that it, it can be pretty okay. strong wind. So yeah, I have I have some pear trees, I have some apple trees, I have some has caps. Um, we have very caps. Um, they are kind of like between a blueberry and a Saskatoon, maybe. Do you okay. know what a Saskatoon berry is? Yeah. yeah, we grow them or, here. They grow quite well here, so a lot of people have started growing them. Okay. But I have not yeah. heard of a, a has cap. Yeah, or a honeyberry. They can be called a has cap and honeyberry are the same thing. Huh. Okay. I have not heard of either one of those. Interesting. I'm going to have to look Yeah, they grow really grow well. well yeah. Yeah. So far, because it takes a long time to become established and because I've definitely okay. had a learning curve with it, I do not have an abundance of fruit. I have strawberries. Those do all right. Do they? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, they do. And you? And so, yeah, still work. So you also said that, because um, I like to kind of get people's not just what they do, but a little bit of their story. You said that you're not doing this full time. This isn't your full time gig. This is kind of your your part time gig. And so you're also you also have another job outside mm-hmm. of gardening. Um, do you want to share a little bit about that? And um, sure. So gardening. I work. Yeah, I I work point five on the ambulance as paramedic. A primary care paramedic. I have been doing that for 17 years, I think. Okay. Um, and I did, yeah, I did mention to you earlier, I, I was off work with PTSD okay. for a year and a half. And that was through like some, some really hard calls at work. Um, that was a really, really tough time in my life, a time when I was struggling to do anything. Mm-hmm. And gardening um although i was very quiet on social media and i still have not gotten back in my rhythm of writing for my blog so i did a ton of writing before my ptsd and since i still struggle a little bit with i think the focus maybe to sit down and write a blog post i'm hoping that will come back with time um but i have been be- been back at work for a while now and uh yeah i'm also on the volunteer fire department here I had wow. always said I would do that when my daughter was 12 because I did that for um, six years before she was born. And my first year on mat leave, I still responded to calls. And then when I went back to work, it was full time. And okay. so I gave up the volunteer fire department and I've been able to rejoin that recently, which I love. I really do love really emergency cool. service work. So it sounds yeah, sometimes, like it. It sounds like sometimes it. I'm juggling, juggling. A lot, but I've also realized that's part of my personality and I thrive on a lot going on. So I just try and learn to find peace and quiet within my many hobbies. Yeah. Well, you said that um, because of this job, which is obviously that kind of jobs, both of those jobs would be fairly high stress. You said that you, that gardening and your faith have played a pretty large role in you being able to handle that stress load. So I thought that was really neat because gardening is a huge part of my happy place and where I go to um, just calm down and think. So I thought Mm -hmm. that was really, really neat. Yeah, there's something so peaceful, hey, about going out to the garden, the birds singing. Yeah, in fact, one of my... um, one of my favorite hems. I don't know if you, a lot of people don't know old hems, but one of my favorite old hems is um, the one in the garden. I can, I, 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 I shouldn't garden sing. Alone. I'm starting yeah, to I'm sing. I'm not going to sing because I don't have a singing. To the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. Yes, that and is one of I my hear. favorite. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think one of, of that. One. Yeah. But so I often think about that when I'm walking through the garden. 
just kind mm-hmm. of a peaceful place where just calm down and pick. I, I actually enjoy weeding. I'm one of those strange people that enjoys weeding. So you know what? I am with you. That is interesting. Yeah. My coffee cup in the mornings and yeah, I just, you know, I, I don't generally think, oh no, I need to weed my whole garden, but I just go out there and I pick yeah. weeds while I sip my coffee and yeah. You just pull a few up. Enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right now, are you guys having um, a fairly normal winter there? We have, yeah. we have such an odd winter here. It's very warm. So I wondered if you guys okay. were having um, a pretty normal weather winter for you guys I would say it's fairly normal um we maybe haven't been quite as cold as some years although we did dip down to minus 40 which I know is the same in Celsius and Fahrenheit for a while in January it is very cold um and right now today it was minus 26 Celsius here Uh, I did the math because I'd posted on Instagram and that's minus 15 Fahrenheit I think so how do your chickens do in that? They are in an insulated coop. And okay. when it gets down to minus 40, um, anything below minus 30 Celsius, we usually turn on a heat lamp. Okay. But in the minus 20, minus 26, they're totally fine. It doesn't okay. phase them. The yeah. breed that you have. It's, what Do you have a specific breed or are they just like farm chicken? <laughs> right now, it's kind of the farm chicken. I have okay. some of the Americana, some of the um, BCM the black copper moran oh, that laid the dark okay. eggs yeah mm-hmm. yeah so, so cool. kind of a mix of heritage breeds that i hatched okay, very cool. i hatched all these guys myself from eggs of oh, my wow. own or friends so they were just a mix so are your birds <laughs> solely for laying them these ones are we do also raise meat chickens do you um okay. yeah have you done meat chickens as well ever i have not actually raised them, them myself but i have helped harvest hundreds and hundreds of them oh and yeah i can't wait well right we're on a quarter of an acre so we don't we can't do that where we're at so i've just gone and helped friends and then come home with them yeah well, yeah it's nice you can be part i can't of wait it. to do I can't wait to raise some, which will be happening for us probably next year. So, yeah. Oh, are you planning to move or? We are. We are. Oh, that's so exciting. We, um, we have been planning this for years and it just kind of happened like three years ago where we bought some property and we're mm-hmm. hopefully, we. it's almost 100% that we will be moving sometime next winter and um, hopefully getting all of the ducks in a row so we can have some meat birds. I'm I'm Thanks. trying to um, keep my expectations low because I know it's going to be stressful to move and we're going to have to rebuild all the soil, which is the very sad part because I've been here 14 years and I've got beautiful soil now, but now I have to do that all over again. But I, I think that birds, you know, the birds will be able to help me rebuild soil. So, Mm-hmm. So yeah. how much land will you have at your new place? We will go from a quarter of an acre to 20 acres. Wow. Oh, that so, would yeah. be so fun. So eight, yeah. 80 pieces of our property now <laughs> inside of what we have. And it's mind blowing. That is a crazy <laughs> yeah. way to look at it. It's a yeah. little overwhelming, but we think to ourselves, man, look what we've done here. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. If I can do that on a small piece of property, I can mm-hmm. do so much more on a big, and it, and it's helped us not to spread out. So we can probably keep a lot of that 20 acres just natural. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. most of what's towards the house, we can keep in um, in working condition for the, for the farm with animals and gardens. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask you, I just thought of this, because we are going to be needing some bigger dogs so what do you so you have lgds do you have them because you like them or do they help you with the chickens do they help keep the deer off do you have other predators we definitely have other predators and i'm trying to remember why we got our first one and i think i was hoping she would help with the chickens um we had a black lab at that time who was sick and i i love having bigger dogs um even when we were in town, we had our black lab. So we have foxes and okay. we've lost, I think it's 26 chickens to the foxes before oh these two dogs were mature wow. and before we had to. 
I, the foxes came through three times and it's just devastating to find, you know, your pet chickens. Um, I, I actually sewed. Imagine. Yeah, I sewed one up with a sewing needle and she was amazing. She didn't even flinch. My husband held her and she healed quite nicely. And then the fox came back and killed her the second time it came through. Oh my goodness. So, and I, we had one chicken called Sunny that would follow my daughter around when she was like two and they were besties. And so, yeah, when you find them dead, it's like, oh my! Word. I know, you know, foxes are beautiful and whatever, but when they're killing your pets, yes. it's pretty hard. Yes. So we still have foxes around. I saw one probably two, three weeks ago, just like, um, I'm not necessarily good with my math, but like 200 meters off our property okay. and our dogs have an invisible fence. We did have to get that because right. um, Pyrenees are known for their wandering. Um, so yes, we did have to invest in that invisible fence, but our dogs, I, I love them so much. They are amazing and they're amazing with the chickens. The other day I heard them barking during the day, which usually they don't, they'll bark at night a little bit, but Anyways, I went outside to see what they were barking at, and they were chasing off a raven. And not oh, wow. apparently, it's not genetic to teach dogs to watch the skies, but especially our one, she watches the skies. And we do have owls, and we have hawks. And I was going to ask you to get birds of prey. Okay, we do, yeah. And we had yeah. lost chickens to that as well before okay. these two dogs, but they work in pairs, and they that's what they do. They guard to the property and um, they're great with the kids. They're, you know, yeah. part of our family too, but at the same time they do their job and um, it helps me feel safe when the kids are outside. And even just, right. I don't know if you have much theft there, but I feel like the dogs are, they, Not they don't, they know who's allowed on the property. Are they, um, are they a breeding pair or they're not. So w one is the mother of the other. So we have okay. a mother and her daughter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have two females. Yeah, we have two males, um, but they're not Pyrenees. They're not going to be bigger. We have bears here. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have we're going to need bigger dogs. That our dogs are um, more herding dogs for herding. Yeah. They're Australian shepherds, shepherd okay. Bernese mountain dogs. So the oh, great wow. the um, the great Pyrenees are much much bigger and more for livestock guardian yeah mm -hmm. i would love to yeah. get two of them and we're hoping to grow some um rabbits to feed our oh. dogs we right now our dogs are eating part raw so we would like to feed the dog get some rabbits and feed the dogs mm -hmm. so, <laughs> and you yeah. can actually feed dogs um raw chicken with bone in i don't know if you that's know what that, our dogs are eating yeah right now. okay yeah. yeah yeah it's uh I only just did that for the first time a few weeks ago. I had gotten some chicken that was part of like a farm food right. pickup that somebody shared. And I, I was nervous about it. And I'd read so many times that you can. But anyways, yeah, it's good yeah, to know. It's a, and it's just a little bit of an ick factor to get past the fact that they're chomping down raw meat and then maybe kissing you. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our dogs have been super healthy for it. They do still get kibble. But mm -hmm. they get part of that. And yeah, mm -hmm. and our our cats do, too. And we have cats to keep down rodents. Mm -hmm. So. But okay. that's that's really cool. So you guys right now, it's March. So do you guys still have snow on the ground? We do. Currently, okay. like I mentioned, the temperatures are cold and it snowed quite a lot last week or just a few days ago we had a big snowstorm so okay. we had at least 10 inches of snow probably nice but we a month ago we had a warm spell and it was melting and nice outside so we have it's called chinooks and we have warm wind that comes through the mountains okay. from west and so during the winter we'll get these chinooks of warm winds which actually are really hard on perennials because it starts to yes. thaw the ground and warm up things. And it takes that insulating snow off the ground and then it freezes again. So, yeah. That's my current concern because we actually lost all of our snow and it's been really warm. And I'm worried that some of my fruit trees will bud and then we'll get a hard freeze. And oh, well, yeah, because it's, it's unseasonably warm here. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, we got a Chinook, but we're not from Canada. So they call it. Is it El Nino? El Nino? Okay. One of the two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, unless you have something else to say, I think this has been a great um, 
podcast. I think that we have learned a lot about growing in a colder grow zone. And then you also have some sites. Can you tell everybody where you're at? Because you're at a few places, social media, and then you have a website. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we will put those in the show notes for people to go to the website. And then they can click and find your information and find you because there's a lot of information out there about growing in a little bit warmer climates. A lot of people grow even warmer than me, but more my climate, you know, down to, you know, zone eight or whatever. A lot of people grow within that, but not a lot mm-hmm. of people are growing it in zone three and don't realize that you can grow in zone three and you're doing it well. I've seen your beautiful photos on Instagram. So Thanks. it'd be really nice for people to be able to go and look at your stuff and learn some things. So tell me yeah. about where to find you. Yeah. So as mentioned, uh, my website is www.zone3. That's the number three, vegetablegardening.com. And um, there I've just written, I've tried to write posts on all the veggies that I feel like I've figured out tips and tricks for and shared those there as well as things like your soil. And um, then on Instagram, zone three vegetable gardening, again, is my handle there. Krista Green is my name. When you look me up, hopefully you can find me. Um, And that is where I post a lot. I'm also on Facebook. I'm not a huge Facebook person. So although I am on Facebook, I don't post there quite as much. I have a gardening group that I run. I have a page there as well as my personal Krista Green page. Um, Pinterest, you can find me on Pinterest. And I do have some videos on YouTube. I okay. haven't t- done many lately, but I do have a few videos there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and to learn more about growing in cold climates. So thanks again yeah, for thanks. your time. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. It's super nice chatting with you. I always love talking to other people who have similar passions and yeah, similar, just, I guess, something that they're working towards for their lifestyle. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, as always, as I usually end the podcast, I tell people um, goodbye and grow where you're planted.